Welcome to 3ABN Cyber School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and it is a privilege and a joy for me to be with you during this hour. But I am not alone. We have part of the 3ABN family here on this Cyber School panel, and I would like to present them to you. To my left is Professor Daniel Perrin. Thank you. I have Monday's lesson, which is going to give us something we need, advice to parents. Excellent. Praise the Lord. We have Pastor John Lomacang. And what a segue from advice to parents to slavery in the scriptures. Mm. <laughs> That's what I have on Tuesday. Tuesday, very good. We have Dr. Yvonne Shelton with us. Welcome. Thank you. I have Wednesday's lesson, Slaves of Christ. Amen. And we have uh, at the other end, <laughs> we have Pastor James Rafferty. Welcome. Good to be here, John. I have Thursday's lesson, which is Masters Who Are Slaves. Masters Who Are Slaves. This is going to be a powerful study in the book of Ephesians. And we uh, encourage you, if you do not have a lesson, you can go to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and download one for free or visit your local Seventh-day Adventist church and you can get one there for free. Before we begin this study, we are going to ask Pastor John Lomacan if he will lead us to the Lord in prayer. Sure, let's, let's bow our heads. Gracious Father in heaven, every time we open the Word of God, we enter a book that's far deeper and far more relevant in all of us understanding than we are. And so we ask for spiritual guidance as we handle uh, the topic that is presented before us today, be with each of our presenters, and may the Spirit of God have His way as our minds are guided by His influence. May the Word be clear and may those listening and watching find in our teaching today the person of Christ whom they will decide, uh, desire and decide to serve and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And I bring to you the memory text for this uh, lesson. And it is taken from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9. The lesson is quoting from the uh, NIV. And it says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. As we consider Ephesians chapter 6 in this study, we realize that this is a lesson that is applicable to today. Today, in the time that we're living in, this is important for us today. And the title for Sunday's portion of the lesson is Advice to Children. I'm going to do a slight retitle or suggest one, and that is I prefer to call this directive to children because as this, these days you say, well, we're giving you advice. You can take it or leave it. But no, these are directives that are vitally important and are of great blessing to follow. I want to give you a little background before we get to chapter 6. Uh, let's go to chapter 5 and just read a few verses here and there to give a little context to where we have been, and then we'll take off. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Moving to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5, 20 and 21, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. With this context, let's move to Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. This verse is worded correctly. We should obey parents in the Lord. Question, how long are children children? <laughs> All their life. How long are parents parents? All their life. So, you know, sometimes we think the children, once they grow up, you don't have to obey your parents anymore. No, but it says obey your parents in the Lord. Mm -hmm. This is lifelong. But when you look at this verse, it says at the end, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And this word right is a word that means just. It means also right. But in some places, in, well, in, in many verses, it is translated also as righteous. So it is righteous for children to obey their parents. And uh, I want to now 
uh, bring you to a story. You see, uh, this idea of children obeying parents, I thank the Lord for my wife, Idalia, and the Lord has blessed us with two children, Samuel first and then Caleb, and we have learned some valuable lessons from them. You know, we think we teach children, but the Lord teaches us through our children, and it is uh, interesting, uh, each one is different. And I remember Caleb uh, being a little, little boy, and when he did something wrong, I remember uh, correcting him and, and telling him, well, son, this is the way it should be. You should not do it that way. You should do it this way. And his answer was, yes, papi. And papi means daddy in Spanish. So and he, it, he told me, I got it. I got it. I understand. And so he did the right thing. As some time passed, and again, something happened. And I said, Caleb, the way this is done is this way. You did it the wrong way. This is the right way to do it. And he said, yes, papi. And then, you know, I noticed that every time I told him something, he would say, yes, papi. And after he, I said that to him one time, is he saying yes, papi, because he, he knows that's what I want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> or is he saying it because he's got it and he's going to follow it? So I started, what? And he did follow those things. You know, it's interesting that children, from children we can learn, they depend on their parents yeah. uh, and they uh, are submissive to their parents. And you see sometimes children learn behaviors as time goes on that are contrary to what they have learned, but it is the parents' uh, opportunity and privilege to lead them in the way of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You see, we need to set an example for children so that they will understand this is the way. And we have some uh, very powerful things to share with you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. This is a promise of the Lord that if you honor your father and mother, children, uh, and it's a commandment with a promise, the Lord will bless you and it will be well with you and you may live long on earth. Mm -hmm. And this is a blessing from the Lord and the Lord fulfills His promise. And Dr. John McVeigh, the Professor John McVeigh, he has a quote here in the lesson that I like to read to you. It says, Paul completes his exhortation to children by quoting the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, bearing witness to the high value he places on the Ten Commandments as a source of guidance for Christian believers. He begins the quotation, honor your father and mother, breaks into, uh, into it with an editorial comment, which is the first commandment with a promise, that's what Paul adds, and then completes the citation that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. The fifth commandment, the quote says, bears witness that honoring parents is part of God's design for human beings to, to uh, thrive. Respect for parents, imperfect though they may be, will help foster health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Now I go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And it says, obey your parents in the Lord, there may be some parents that are deviating from the ways of the Lord and children have a responsibility that is higher than their parents and that is to God Himself, our Creator, our loving Heavenly Father. I'd like to read a quote to you because this is a very serious matter. Uh, we are, those that are blessed with children, have a great responsibility to lead them in the way of the Lord. And this is from uh, an article, Review and Herald, December 31, 1901. 1901, Sister Ellen G. White says, it is impossible to depict the evil, the evil which results from leaving a child to a, his own will. Some who go astray because of neglect during childhood will through patient, painstaking effort be brought to the light and led to walk in the narrow way, but many, are lost forever because in childhood they received only a one-sided culture. The precious motive, power, 
of the life is wasted and the sin lies at the door of the parents mm -hmm. who must answer to God for their neglect. Right. Yes, mother and fathers, uh, we are going to have to answer to God for neglect of teaching the children, our children, your children, in the way of the Lord. And so I uh, encourage you to look into the scriptures. There's wonderful guidance there for us. Uh, another quote from Review and Herald, November 15, 1892, says the following, the best way to educate children to respect their father and mother, listen carefully, because this is the best way. It says here, is to give them the opportunity of seeing the father offering kindly atten attentions to the mother and the mother rendering respect and reverence to the father. It is by beholding love in their parents that children are led to obey the fifth commandment and to heed the injunction Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is wonderful instruction for us, and that's the best way. They need to see these things and hear these things. And as they see and hear these things, they will follow the example. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. This is not something new. It goes back to the beginning of time. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. You, sh you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. We have a great responsibility to teach the children that the Lord blesses us with because they are a heritage of the Lord. The Lord blesses us with children so that we may teach them in the way so that they can be a light to the world. And you know, one of the strongest arguments uh, for the gospel is a, a family that's uh, together, that loves the Lord mm -hmm. and follows the Lord with all their heart. It is hard to argue with that. And uh, in Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, uh, I'm going to read quickly here in verse beginning in verse 1. It says, at, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let us follow the example of children and humbly submit to God. All right. yeah. Thank you very much. That uh, advice to children or uh, directives to children leads us to <laughs> advice or directives then to parents. Amen. And this is a serious topic and a serious te text because character formation does not begin when you turn 18. <laughs> or when you leave home to go to college. It begins in those earliest days. And so Ephesians 6 verse 4, one text says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And I think about this text because I have children. I have five children who are still young enough for me to apply this in my life. And I'll put the parallel text with that. It comes right after what Pastor Dinsey read in Colossians 3.20. Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, once again, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And that would be discouraged in their walk with Christ, mm -hmm. that they begin to depart from Him. Children are to obey and honor. Whom? Whom are they to obey and honor? God. Mm -hmm. That's who they are to obey and honor. But in God's place here on earth are father and mother. Paul focuses particularly on fathers here, uh, not because every home is the same, but there will be principles here that we can apply to anybody who leads children because fathers represent the father. Everything begins in the home through parents, attitudes, traits, habits, talents, obedience and disobedience particularly. By obeying parents, children will learn how to obey God. And that's a principle that we should study and think about.
that uh, when we give instructions to children, they should be things that they can obey, that they can understand, because we will help to nourish in them the spirit of uh, surrender, the spirit of obedience and respect, or the spirit of rebellion mm -hmm. and self-will. And those things will then be transferred to the spiritual life. We can't just ignore rebellion in the children. And so it goes without saying that parents better be submitted to God so that we are directing our children to obey correctly. Fathers are not to leave all the caring to the wife, to the mother. Mothers tend to educate from the early childhood years and they should be supported by the great affection and strength and support by their husband, by the father. Um, that it says, do not provoke indicates that fathers should be actively involved. It doesn't mean don't provoke your children by getting out of the way and just standing back and not being involved. You have to be involved because work, especially for fathers, can become very consuming. It can consume our time, it can consume our energy, all of our attention, yeah. our mind can be elsewhere, even when we're at home and it's as if you're never here with us, even though you're sitting there at the table. Yeah. It's so easy to put all sorts of other things first because oh, my family's always there, they'll, they'll be there. But time goes by, and as we do not invest with them, those relationships can deteriorate and disintegrate. Sometimes when we are involved as fathers, we just get frustrated when children display appropriate maturity for their age. And we want to say things like, why don't you grow up? Well, they are growing up. And sometimes we get frustrated when they demonstrate character flaws that they learned from us. Why are those kids always doing that? Oh, yeah, now I remember. <laughs> they saw it in me first. So go back and revisit your childhood. Ask a parent, what was I like to understand? Uh, child Guidance. What a great book for this topic here. Page 251 says, Your children are the younger members of the Lord's family, brothers and sisters entrusted to your care by your heavenly Father for you to train and educate for heaven. Your children are your siblings in Christ. Our children are not given to us as possessions. They're simply members of the family of God that are, in the grand scheme of eternity, a few split seconds younger than we are, all right? They look up to us for training in godliness, all right? They will not always be little. Every word, every action, every interaction we have with them will be permanently registered upon them. All they know is what we teach them or what we allow them to be taught and what the Holy Spirit impresses upon their mind. So our role as parents should be to prepare them for heaven, prepare their character, build up a Christ-like character that they will see demonstrated in us to teach them to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Give them time to do that. Say, here's what the Holy Spirit might be communicating to you and to teach them, literally ask them, have you asked for the Holy Spirit in your life? Because the Holy Spirit fills children as well as adults. That's right. It's so easy sometimes to just hope their spiritual life is going to get on track. Mm -hmm. We need to get involved and ask them questions. Okay. There's so many other things we put first. And we put a lot of attention to what goes on in our work life perhaps, but we should follow the example of God the Father. Genesis 6 verse 7 says he looked at his children going astray and his heart was grieved. Mm. We should care deeply about the things that are going on in the spiritual lives of our children. We are stewards. Those children are entrusted to us. And I have a, a kind of hard quote to share with you from Council, sorry, Child Guidance, page 561. Our heart might rise up against this, but the tender heart we desire our children to imitate in us recognizes the truth of this. Parents who have neglected their God-given responsibilities must meet that neglect in the judgment. The Lord will then inquire, where are the children that I gave you to train for me? Why are they not at my right hand? Mm. Many parents will then see that unwise love blinded their eyes to their children's faults and left those children to develop deformed characters unfit for heaven. Others will see that they did not give their children time and attention, love and tenderness. Their own neglect of duty made the children what they are. 
God has given these children to us. And like the master who entrusts talents to the servants, there's going to come a day when God says, what have you done with what I've given to you? And we have this time given to us. All the things of this earth, homes, cars, motorcycles, RVs, whatever it might be, will pass away. There are some things that can go with us to heaven. Our character goes with us. And right. these relationships mm -hmm. may continue if these children develop a character fit for heaven. I'll give you another one here at Adventist Home, page 533. Parents should labor with reference to the future harvest. While they sow in tears amid many discouragements, it should be with earnest prayer. They may see the promise of but a late and scanty harvest, yet that should not prevent the sowing. They should sow beside all waters, embracing every opportunity both to improve themselves and to benefit their children. Such seed sowing will not be in vain. At the harvest time, many faithful parents will return with joy, bringing their sheaves with them. I like that picture. So what should fathers and by extension mothers do? Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. And I can't give you all the specifics, but you need to pray. We need to pray about this text. Write it out in our own hand. Place it before us because God knows our children. Mm -hmm. He knows their hearts and he knows what they need. And I say, Lord, as I'm learning their temperaments and their skills and their talents, teach me, O oh Lord, how should I interact with and direct and guide these children? How should I bring them up? And I know that God means for us to begin with our relationship with him so we can share with them what they have. And parents, as you have your personal devotions with God, don't just hide it away in the secret place. Right. There's a spot for that. Let your kids see you in prayer, see you in the scriptures, Amen. hear you asking questions of the Bible and pursuing answers. Do that in front of them. Set an example for them in every, in every stage of their life. Every stage of your life, what a Christ-like character looks like. We are to diligently teach them. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. I know that you've already read this here. But these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. In your heart first. You shall teach them diligently. Diligently means this. This is the English definition. Characterized by steady, earnest, and energetic effort. Painstaking comes from a root word meaning to value or esteem highly, to love. That's right. Diligent effort means I love the work, even amid tears of teaching and demonstrating a godly character. Do it when you sit. That's your relaxing time. That is not time just to say, I'm going to have a good time. Your relaxing is for teaching. When you walk, that's your travel. When you lie down, your rest. When you rise up, verse 9, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Your family is to be a billboard seen by everybody passing by. That's what a godly family is like. We're not perfect. This all comes by the grace of God. Don't be discouraged when you stumble and fall. We do that. Our heavenly father loves us too much to leave us down there he picks us up parents god loves you he loves your children keep on coming to him and bringing your children to him in prayer amen amen, amen. thank you so much this is good good information and we hope you have been blessed thus far but we are not done we're going to be back in just a moment Ever wish you could watch a 3 Avian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3AVNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. We are back. Thank you for joining us. And we continue with Pastor John Lumaking. Yes, I am dealing with Tuesday's lesson, Slavery in the Scriptures. What a transition between being a parent and our addressing. And I, I looked at the way that Paul's cadence changed. He gave four verses to children and parenting, and then he went right to bond servants and masters. It's very interesting. So let's begin with Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, and then we'll go back and look at what it means as Paul relates to the bondservant and the masters. Verse 5, bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, 
with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. This bond servant, master, uh, earthly master, earthly slave, heavenly master, it's a reciprocal relationship. Hmm. It's a revolving door. Uh, this, the bond servant is to provide service to the master in the same way he would to the Lord. The master is to honor the bond servant, knowing that he's accountable to the, to the master in heaven. Mm -hmm. and, and I like the way that Paul ends it. He says, there is no partiality. In other words, the way you treat your servant is the way the Lord is going to treat you. Mm -hmm. The way the servant serves the master is the way that the servants should serve the heavenly master. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this word bond servant in the Hebrew, it comes from the word, it's spelled E-B-E-D, but it's pronounced erbed, erbed, meaning it has a connotation that some, in some degree like an indentured servant or like uh, an enslaved person, but the difference is very amazing. A bond servant doesn't serve for wages. A bond servant doesn't serve for wages, but the bond servant and his household are taken care of by the master. Mm. They don't get paid, but all their needs are provided by the master. Mm. So the bond servant may come with his wife and children to be the person that lives on the land of the master and everything he does, every, all of his needs are provided. Mm. God shall supply all of our need mm -hmm. according to his riches and glory. That's where the master, we are servants of the master in heaven. He supplies all of our needs like the bond servant's needs are supplied by, supplied by the earthly flesh master. And then we find in Exodus 21, verse 5 to 6, that um, the, the similarities ended where you had the indentured servant, you had the enslaved one, and you had the bond servant. Now, the indentured servant uh, ultimately attained his or her freedom once they completed their contract. So an indentured servant made a contract, said, I will work for you for X amount of years. When I'm done, I'm free. Mm. Uh, an enslaved person had no rights. They were permanent property of the person that purchased them. Now, uh, but the bond servant, although none of his, he didn't get wages, all of his needs were provided. So Paul uses the term or the word bond servant, once again, illustrating as Paul says, that God shall supply all of our needs. Mm -hmm. And so when you begin to look at the clarity, but that same word, erbed in the Hebrew, is used for Joshua, for David, for Isaiah, and for Jesus, as it all relates to them being servants. Look at Joshua, Joshua 24, 29. Now it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, the word there is the same word in the Hebrew, erbed, the servant of the Lord, meaning he's a bond servant, meaning God is supplying all of Joshua's needs. Joshua, and this is important, Joshua is not serving God for wages. Mm -hmm. Let's put this together. We don't minister for wages. Now, you know, if you've been a pastor in the Adventist church, you don't do it for <laughs> wages. We do it because we love the Lord. And you'll see that illustrated in just a moment here. In Exodus 21, verse 5 to 6, the servant, the bond servant, is referred to here when his time came that his master was going to free him. Notice how Moses illustrates the relationship that developed between the bond servant and the master. Exodus 21, verse 5 and 6. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Notice what he says. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And so you've seen this happen to cows. You know, a lot of times when people own thousands of cows, you see a, a, a hole in their ear. This is very interesting because when you are, when you became a 
property of a master and you serve them forever, the visibility of the earring was evidence that you belong to somebody else. Hmm. But when the earring was removed, I want you to get this now, when the earring was removed, you no longer belong to that individual, you are free. Thus, we find one of the reasons why the Lord did not support the wearing of ornaments to the children of Israel. They were, they were slaves in Egypt, but they didn't wear the earrings. The Egyptians wore it voluntarily. So when the Israelites began to put it on, the Lord said, wait a minute, I set you free. Why show yourself visibly as a person who is in bondage to the very land I set you free from? That's another topic, another day. <laughs> and so we find Joshua, David, Isaiah, all the same word, Irbed, in the Hebrew is referring to them, but it refers to them as servants of the Lord. Even Jesus, in Isaiah 53 and verse 11, the Bible says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, Jesus being the righteous servant of his heavenly father. And what is he doing? He shall bear their iniquities. In a similar manner, the needs of the bondservant were bore by the person that they served. In the same way, the heavenly father bore the needs that Jesus had when he served his heavenly father on earth. But then there's a different kind of slavery. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And the Bible gives us a different picture of a kind of slavery today that, that exists today, even though it exists in a society where people say, I'm no longer a slave. Romans 6, 16 differs. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves, the Greek word doulos, to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. I want you to grab this now. The slavery that Paul talks about here is a slavery that doesn't have a visible master but it has a master nonetheless. The master is sin. Mm. So watch this. When you yield yourself to be a servant to sin, a slave to sin, you don't see slaves telling the master what to do. That's right. The master tells the slaves what to do. Mm -hmm. Let me make this very clear. When you yield yourself to the slavery of sin, it will take you farther than you never intended to go That's right. and make you pay a price you never intended and cannot afford. Mm. Mm. Why? because you don't, you don't call the shots. Look at this. Look at Romans 7, 17. Paul talks about the slavery. The word slavery or servant or doulos is both good and bad. Here's the Romans 7, 17. This is the bad side. When Paul was converted, he saw in his life, he still had difficulties. And notice what he linked it to. The comparison is amazing. Romans 7, 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's a slave to sin that's leading him from disobedience to uh, leading from sin leading to death. He said, I'm not in control. The sin is, it is no longer I. I want you to grab that. When you yield to sin, you can't tell sin how far to take you. Mm -hmm. It takes you because it is, you are not in, it is no longer you. That's right. But look at the beauty of the other side of that. And it's amazing how Paul in both books, Galatians and Romans, how identical these phrases are. Look at Galatians 2 verse 20. Remember now in Romans 7, 17, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Notice the contrast. When you yield to sin, it is no longer you, but sin that lives in you. But when you yield to Christ, it is no longer you, but Christ who lives in you. And what does that mean? You are no longer a slave to sin, but now you are a slave to righteousness. What does that mean? When you yield yourself to Christ, he can take you farther in your character than you ever thought you could go. He can display through you a character, a veracity, a righteousness that you never thought and never in your own imagination ever experienced. You can never say, how could I become so good only because the master is perfect. When the master is in charge, he brings your life to a perfection that you never imagined. But when sin is in charge, it brings your life to a degradation you never imagined. So here's my point as I transition. Decide to choose the one who leads you from obedience to righteousness and not slave to death. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. This has been really rich. So may I be fully transparent with you? Okay. Okay. You may be fully transparent. I, I hate to admit it, 
But before doing all the research for the Sabbath School panel, mm -hmm. I just was dreading, I was dreading this because the, my topic is slaves of Christ mm -hmm. and slavery is so abhorrent to me. Mm -hmm. And when I read Ephesians 6 and, the, and where slaves are told to obey their masters with fear and trembling, I knew that some of these texts were oh, used yeah. to control slaves. They were used to justify the atrocities mm -hmm. that were perpetuated on slaves. And so I was like, mm, but, but I prayed about it. I was like, Lord, please lead me to the right resources mm -hmm. so that I can get the right perspective on, on all of this. And he really did. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share it with you because I'm excited. Okay, okay so. Good. When we think of the word slave, we normally don't associate that with our relationship to Christ. Mm -hmm. We don't think in slave language. We think about the freedom that we have in him. We think about how God is going to bring us to fulfillment of our purpose. We think of freedom in Christ, but we don't really think of slave. But what exactly is our relationship supposed to be? And how does the Bible frame our relationship to Christ. When we read the original Greek text, and then Pastor, you brought the Hebrew out, the Urbe, and then, and then the doulos, the Greek. When we read in the original text, the Greek word for slave is doulos, as you mentioned. In the KJV, the King James Version, the New King James Version, there are 20 English versions of the Bible, standard English versions of the Bible, and they all substitute the word servant for slave. It's really interesting mm -hmm. because they don't use doulos. They don't, they use doulos in certain places, but they don't use the word slave. Right. They use servant. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between slaves and servants. Doulos should never be translated into any other word than slave. In all of the lexicons, all the words in the doulos word group describe the status of a slave. In the original Greek text, the word slave appears 130 times, but it's found once in the King James. And in the New King James and New American Standard, slave is found a few times. For example, when referring to actual slavery or when referring to an inanimate reality like sin. Mm -hmm. It's used there. But other than that, it's avoided. The translators avoided it mm -hmm. because like me, they probably had this aversion to the concept mm -hmm. of slavery because there's mm -hmm. such a stigma attached to that word. So example, in Matthew 6, 24, in the original text, Jesus said, no man can be a slave to two masters. But our Bibles say no man can serve two masters. And there is that difference between servant and a slave. You brought this out right. too. A servant is hired to work for wages. Mm -hmm. A slave is owned. Mm -hmm. That's right. So there are two different things. There are six words in, in the Bible for, in the New Testament, for servant. But doulos is not one of them. There's only one word for slave and it's doulos. And then there's another derivative, soon doulos, which is fellow slave. Mm -hmm. um, when Paul addressed the church at Ephesus, he was addressing, addressing husbands, wives, slaves, and masters. In Ephesians 6, 5, he talks to the slaves. And then in verse 9, they're masters. It is in verses 5 and 6, we are introduced to the phrase slaves of Christ. In the NIV, it says, slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service. In other words, not just when they're looking as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So here you have the introduction of that phrase, slaves of Christ. And then if you look in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul regulates people's human relationships once they've come to Christ. He talks to the virgins. He talks to people who are married to unbelievers. And he also addresses the slave. And he says in verses 22, 20 to 22, 
Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. I like that. Mm -hmm. For the one who was a slave when, when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. And similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. And then in verse 23, Paul makes it clear what constitutes slavery. He says, you were bought at a price. Right. Do not become slaves of men. So what does it mean to be a slave? Mm -hmm. You're owned, you were bought, mm -hmm. okay? So the apostles ascribe this identification to themselves. Paul in the original text in Romans 1.1 1, 1, introduces himself as Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. And then it's the same in Philippians 1.1 1, 1, where he includes Timothy and says, they are slaves of Christ Jesus. I only do what pleases my master, Paul says. And then in Titus, again, he introduces himself as Paul, a slave of God. This is a single focus of being a slave. Mm -hmm. You don't have to please a lot of people. You just please one. That's right. The metaphor is critical to understanding our personal relationship with the Lord. Right. We are slaves. That's right. We are slaves. Yes. We do what pleases him. We obey him. We're all slaves to something or someone. And you brought this out, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 16 says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But Paul wasn't the only apostle that identified as a slave. James, the brother of Jesus, also identified as a slave. He said, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why in chapter four, verses 13 to 15, he says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. He goes on to say, we should say, if the Lord wills, right. we shall live and do this or that. That's slave language. That's right. mm -hmm. It's not our not choice. Mm -hmm. It is slave language. We are slaves of Christ. Peter, Paul, James, Jude, these are our spiritual A-listers and they identify themselves as slaves of Christ. So let's look at five characteristics of slaves. Number one, slaves have exclusive ownership. A servant can be hired and quit. A slave is owned. Number two, a slave is subject only to one alien or outside will. No man or woman can be a slave to two masters. You can have two employers, but you can't have two masters, right? And then number three, a slave has complete and constant availability and obedience. One master is in control and the constant obedience indicates singular devotion to that master. Number four, the slave had complete dependence on his master for everything and number five, all discipline and reward come from one master. Now, all of this is directly related to our relationship to Christ. We're owned by him because we're bought with his precious blood. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. We must be in a, a position of complete and constant availability and obedience to our one master to the degree that we can say, not my will, but thy will be done. Right. And then as Christians, we should be completely dependent upon God for protection and provision. He's provided our needs both physically and spiritually and all discipline and reward comes from him. Right. So the New Testament does not condemn or condone slavery. Mm -hmm. It simply acknowledges it. Right. It acknowledges its reality and it regulates the relationship between slaves and masters and let mm -hmm. slaves know what they're to do and masters, how they're to treat their slaves. Mm -hmm. So, Paul tells us in Galatians 3.28, in Christ there is neither bond nor free, all are one. We're all right. one in Christ Jesus. So let me end with this statement. Being a slave to Jesus Christ is beyond any kind of slavery we could ever have. When we choose Jesus, God our master makes us his sons and daughters and gives us all the rights of his own sons. He adopts us into his family, calls us joint heirs with Christ, takes us to heaven where we will rule and reign with him forever. We will have eternal joy and peace. Amen. So if I'm gonna be a slave to someone, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be a slave to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I choose to be a slave to God. What a gift, 
What an honor. What a wonderful master he is. That's right. What about you? Who are you choosing today? Mm -hmm. Where is your choice? Who is your master? We all have a master. Make it Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I love the, the, the transition actually from children obey your parents to slaves obey your masters because a lot of children think they're slaves <laughs> when you think about that, right? And they are in this sense. There's only two positions we can take. My name is James Raffrey. I have Thursday's lessons, masters who are slaves. And that is we're going to be the slave of sin. And we're going to be the slave of God. And like Yvonne said, which one are you going to choose? And the choice has got to be up to our understanding of what the master's like, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to choose to be a slave to God, we're not going to feel like slaves at all. That's right. <laughs> Anything else, and we're going to feel the slavery. And it's the same with parents. If parents are like God to their children, their children are going to be okay. You remember the prodigal son? Remember the one that stayed at home? I've been serving you all this time, and I never got a fatted calf and all the... You're my... You're, everything I have is yours, mm -hmm. right? Attitude. Attitude is everything. And God is telling us in this lesson powerfully that he's unfolding for us what slavery actually looks like. It's bondage. It's mean. It's ugly in this world and to the prince of this world and everyone that follows his principles. And it's beautiful and it's glorious. In fact, it's so glorious that Jesus Christ took it on. He became, it says in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself of his divinity. He came in the form of a servant slave. Mm -hmm. And he put the all through his ear. He was pierced mm -hmm. because he said, I'm not leaving this family. Mm -hmm. I'm staying with this family. Mm -hmm. And in heaven, he's going to serve us, right? Mm -hmm. We see Christ as the ultimate master who became a slave. Now, assuming you're a Christian, the quarterly says, a Christian slave master who's listening to the, to the Ephesians being read, Ephesus, excuse me, listening to, listening to the book of Ephesians being read out in your house, church, you might react to this counsel. Or how might you react to this counsel being offered in the presence of your slaves? So here you are, you're the master, your slaves are around and you're listening, you're a believer and you're listening to servants, be obedient to them that you're masters according to the flesh. We're reading Ephesians chapter six, verses five through nine, uh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart unto as unto the Christ. And I can see the master, he's listening, he's going, yes. <laughs> Not with eye service as men pleases, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And he's like, I'm so glad I became a Christian. Just listen to this, guys. Come on, come on. I need more service. With good, uh, with, with good will doing service as to the Lord, not to men. Oh, man, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And you're just like a slave master, just like, yes. And all of a sudden you get to verse 9. And you masters do the same things unto them. Mm -hmm. wait, 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 wait a minute, I'm the master. No, no, wait. Do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. We are on the same ground. All of us are. See, Society, the world, tries to make masters and slaves. Society and the world tries to put us into a caste system. But at the cross, the ground is level. There's no caste system at the cross. We're all the same. Mm -hmm. And this is what Paul is communicating. And so as he moves through this, you know, and addressing the masters and slaves, he's doing it with a pointed exhortation. Uh, he, the quarterly goes on to say it turns on sharp, uh, a sharp contrast between the lords, which is translated as masters, who had a habit of threatening their slaves, and the Lord Christ, with whom there is no partiality. Hmm. Paul asked masters to do the same to them. The slaves, which would have been shocking, the slaves, which would have been shocking to first century slave owners, masters should, res should respond to their slaves with deeds of goodwill governed by their allegiance to Christ. Corresponding to what Paul had just asked of slaves, he tells them to stop threatening their slaves. A common practice in the time in which masters administered a wide variety of punishments, including beatings, sexual abuse, being sold, extreme labor, starvation, shackles, branding, and even death, and nothing has changed. Paul supports his command with two motives for the slave masters to look beyond the social structures of the Greek or Roman world. And these two points, these two motives are for us today. We need to look beyond this present world. Motive number one, they and their presumed slaves are co-slaves of the single master, knowing that he is both their master and your master. And Yvonne, Yvonne powerful, right? We're to look beyond this present world and we're to recognize we're all slaves of the same master. That's right. 
Masters, give unto your servants, Colossians 4 verse 1 says, that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So you don't, it's kind of like this idea, wives submit to your husbands. Oh, that means I can just take advantage of my wife. She needs to submit to me. No, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Right. Hello. Same thing here, right? Masters, give to your servants that which is just and equal. Don't take advantage of this, this position you have because you're supposed to be like Jesus, right? And Jesus was a servant slave. He was a servant master. Number two, the heavenly master judges all without partiality. Since their own master treats those regarded as slaves as on an equal footing with others, so should they. Christ treats us as equals and masters should treat slaves the same way, as mm -hmm. equals. That's mm -hmm. what the Bible is saying here. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about this with Onesimus, uh, am I saying that right? Philemon, you know, Onesimus. Onesimus. Philemon, you know, you kind of want to, who quotes Philemon? <laughs> when was the last time you heard a sermon on Philemon? It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. This book is so powerful. And I just, you know, he's an escaped slave. He becomes converted. He accepts Christ as his savior. And now Paul, Paul sends him back to his master. And he says, now, but not now as a servant. I'm not sending him as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. Mm -hmm. How much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If you count me as a partner, receive him as myself. Mm -hmm. If he's wronged thee or he owes you anything, put it on my account. Mm -hmm. You hear Jesus there? Put it on my account. Mm -hmm. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say how you owe us me even your own self. Again, Jesus speaking there, you know, treat your slaves the way I've treated you. And if there's anything that's owed, put it on my account. You owe me your, you owe me your life. Mm -hmm. So the focus again is Christ. The focus again is heaven. Much of Paul's language in Ephesus would be especially heartening to Christian slaves because they're adopted as sons in Ephesians 1, 5. They're redeemed in Ephesians 1, 7. They're inherited in Ephesians 1, 11 and 14. Uh, they're enthroned with Jesus, Ephesians 2, 6. They become fellow citizens with the household of God, Ephesians 2, 19. And you compare that with Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. So slaves are part of the integral part of the body. So Ephesians 5, uh, 6, 5 through 9, the masters, the slaves, that whole interactive there, uh, this activates all the teachings in the whole letter to the Ephesians. Mm. Everything that's taught in Ephesus is all activated now, is all to be activated now. So you say, well, Paul ends with this thing about, you know, slaves obeying the masters and masters, you know, taking care of his slaves. And we can kind of push that off to the side. No, we can't. No, it's as if Paul was saying, okay, I've got to write to this issue of slavery. It's a terrible situation that's taking place in the world today. What am I going to do? I'll start with the gospel. That'll, that'll lay a good foundation. And then I'll talk about how that relates to the church. And I'll talk about how it relates to, you know, the world, our relationships in the world and in the family. And then finally, maybe they'll get it when I get to slaves. They'll finally get it when I get there. They'll get it. They'll realize that this whole thing is all about the relationships that are the very worst in this world that ought to be just like every other relationship. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus is about restoring relationships and Satan is about destroying relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 7, 20 and 24, Yvonne, you mentioned this, let every man abide in the same thing where he isn't called. If that, are you being called a servant, a slave? Don't care about it. Don't care about it because you don't want to think that way. Joseph didn't think that way, mm. right? When you think about uh, God's people, Jacob didn't think that way. Uh, Daniel didn't think that way. And because they didn't think that way, they weren't that way. Mm. We, we become what we think we are. And what we are is purchased, bought, ransomed, redeemed by the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. Mm. And you let that infiltrate doesn't matter if you're a janitor, doesn't matter if you're a slave, and there are millions of slaves in the world today. You are free. You are free because if you accept Christ as your Savior, Christ has set you free. You have a new standing before God, and it doesn't matter what people say about you, what people think you are. That's why Paul could say, I am a slave of Christ. And Peter could say, I'm a slave of Christ. And James could say, I'm a slave of Christ. And Jude could say, I'm a, a, a slave of Christ. Because none of them had a master except for Christ. None of you should be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. So Jesus Christ calls us to be servants. And one of the 
one of the beliefs that we have as Seventh-day Adventists that, that really helps us to, to understand, to, to humble ourselves as Christ did, is the idea of the foot washing. The ordinance of foot washing is a, at least a quarterly reminder of the humility that we need to have in our mind and our attitude toward others. And God calls us to make things right with people that maybe we have a problem with because this is the ultimate way we can see ourselves not as better than someone else, which is the master mentality, but as equal with all other people. Equal in Christ, bought by Christ, loved by Christ, connected to Christ for all eternity with Christ. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor James Rafferty. And thank you, Dr. Yvonne Shelton, Pastor John Lo McCang, and Professor Daniel Perrin. It's been a, a very a inspiring lesson. And we have a few moments to give each one of you something to, that you want to leave with uh, our, our viewers mm -hmm. and listeners. Uh, it's a, a privilege, a weighty privilege for parents to represent God to our children. But it also means that our home represents God's home, also in heaven. And uh, our homes get to be a little foretaste of heaven on earth, and that's what we all want, and God can help us make that happen in our homes. Yes, Joshua 24, 15, a passage that brings this into sharp focus. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And I end as he said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. 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 All of us will serve something or someone. Romans 6:22 says, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a slave and was made in the likeness of men. Amen, amen. Well, we have a wonderful example in Jesus. And, you know, we read uh, during this study that we should become as little children. And if we don't become as little children, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we recognize that God is our master. And we are his servants, but we also are his children. And it is a marvelous thing to understand that God wants each and every one of us to reach the highest potential. How can we reach the highest potential? By following Jesus with all of our hearts. We hope that you've been blessed during this Sabbath School lesson. This was lesson number 11. We're going to lesson number, number 12, the call to stand. And remember, you can still download a lesson by going to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and get one there for free or visit your closest Seventh-day Adventist church and get one for free there. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.